program, and it's uh, my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, two individuals from uh, Two Six Corporation. Uh, I've I've actually enjoyed a relationship with Two Six for many years. In fact, one of my very close uh, colleagues from my days at Bell Labs is uh, the current CEO of uh, Two Six Corporation, and we've kept in uh, in in good touch over the years. Um, these two gentlemen are leaders in the field of. Uh, of diamond turning technology and associated materials issues, and that's what they'll be talking about today. The title of the talk is The Path to Freeform Optics, Diamond Turned Optics from the Perspective of 26 Infrared, which is a business unit within uh, 26 Corporation. Um, Dr. Alan Hedges uh, received his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Southampton University over in the UK and his PhD from Imperial College in London. And he's the director of the uh, engineering and precision machining at 26 Corporation, where he has worked for uh, 25 years prior to joining 26. He was an optical engineer at British Aerospace in the UK and at Speeding Systems in Minnesota, in Rochester Hill, Minnesota. And since he's been at 26 Corporation, um, he's helped build one of the world's li largest diamond turning operations and has gained a lot of experience in ultra precision machining and testing over a wide range of applications. Uh, Greg Davis, who's joining us as well, received his master's in mechanical engineering from Penn State, and he's a senior engineer in diamond turning at uh, 26 Incorporated, um, where he's worked for 14 years. And he develops and optimizes uh, diamond turning processes for production of freeform and other complex geometry components. So 26 as a whole, and I think you'll see this in the introduction, they are a major a player and consumer of diamond turning technology and and turning that into products uh, out in the field. So it's a great pleasure to have them here and let's uh, welcome them. Please. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so we've gone through the title. Um, I'm going to do an introduction to 2.6. That's probably the h hardest part of my talk is to actually explain what, what 2.6 is and what, what we do. Um, from there, I'll go on and talk about diamond turning technology. And really, the, uh, we, we want to lead to freeform optics, but I want to explain how, as a CO2 laser supplier, the diamond turning technology was changing, our customer requirements were changing, and that drove us into the freeform world, uh, maybe ahead of a lot of other people. And uh, then Greg's doing the tag teaming, so he's going to come in and, and sort of bring you up to date. So mine's a sort of a historical review and Greg will bring you up to date with uh, some of the current capabilities and challenges that we face. So uh, the uh, one question, so we'll address this one now, uh, where does the name 26 come from? And it comes from the periodic table. So the company was founded in 1971 by Dr. Carl Johnson, a material scientist, and he was working with cadmium telluride. So this is back in the Ronald Reagan, president of the US Star Wars uh, era. And this was the material that they were looking to make uh, CO2 laser weapons from. And uh, as a material scientist, uh, Carl began a business making the material, um, quickly got a reputation for having the best material available. Um, but the people fabricating optics out of it weren't doing a very good job, so his business wasn't being successful. So he moved into fabrication. Then the people coding the optics weren't doing a very good job, uh, so he moved into materials, fabrication, and coating. And, and, and this you sort of see play out in 2.6 is be, you've got to become vertically integrated to get your product to the customer. So, uh, so the start was in CADTEL in the 1980s, Raytheon developed zinc selenide. So then this, became the, this was the lowest absorbing material for CO2 laser radiation, and it became a very important material as the CO2 laser uh, got ad adopted into uh, industrial applications. So, so that's where the name comes from. As I said, started in 1971. Um, we went public in 1987 and uh, had our 30th anniversary of being public. And uh, so from a revenue point of view, uh, th this, this chart goes back to 1995. So um, I actually joined the company in 1993. So we were you know, a $20 million company back then. And the, this, this looks pretty flat, but the, if you actually look at the numbers, we're doubling in size every three years. And in, in this era, then, the mission of the company was to be the world leader in CO2 laser optics manufacturing. So we were totally focused on the CO2 laser. Um, 
And, and those lasers were be, being used in sheet metal cutting. I'll show you a little bit on that later on. Um, but as, uh, as we grew, we, we, we became aware, and this acquisition strategy, could, you could talk a long time about this, but initially it was, we have to diversify. So we started, these first investments here were in uh, VLOC and, uh, and um, Lightning Optical Corporation in Florida, and, and that gave us a YAG capability. So we started divesting into different wavelengths. Um, we were successful enough out here to, to purchase, uh, purchase our biggest competitor, which was laser power optics. So that sort of solid, uh, solidified our position in the CO2 market. Um, but everything through here was being driven by the CO2, but then again, going into different materials. So this was our first venture around 2003 into silicon carbide. So this is uh, CVD silicon carbide for high temperature electronics. And that business is now just becoming you know, accepted into the industry where they're seeing the limitations of the silicon and in very high performance applications, this business is beginning to take off. But we, we started going into that material back in 2003. Um, so this is materials again. There's some changes. We went through, uh, Tom mentioned, you know, Chuck Material is the CEO. And as he came into the business, then this is kind of what's driving this. And it's also, we're still generating profits through our CO2 business here, but investing into other technologies and uh, that we recognize the CO2 isn't going to lead us through the next 20 years. Um, what was really evident about that was the one micron laser was coming along. So for, for the one micron laser, much better wall plug efficiency than CO2. And, it, and people making these sheet metal laser cutters started adopting the one micron laser. Um, but so uh, we started investing in one micron. We purchased a company in Berlin that made cutting heads for one micron lasers. That's HiYag. Um, then other things that we're doing, and this is a Chuck Material led one is here, which is Photop Industries. That was an investment of 3,000 people in China in the telecom business. Um, and that, that brought the company into telecom. And then some more recent inv um, investments over here is actually in the wafer fab area. Um, so we have a six inch gallium arsenide wafer fab, and we have uh, two facilities for making Vixels. So, so, um, so laser, uh, missed one, which was uh, an IBM plant in Zurich, which is for uh, laser diodes. So we're making laser diodes so that the people doing fiber lasers are purchasing laser diodes for, from us. Um, and then we're into this Vixel technology, which is leading us into the areas for supporting sensors and the, and the work around that. So, so you can see a lot of diversification, and it sort of falls into, I'll jump ahead to this slide, kind of three main buckets for the company. So this is how we report to the public on the company. So, so this is products that are used in lasers. So supplying people who are making lasers. So it used to be just the CO2, but now it's one micron lasers. We do laser diodes, pump modules for lasers. Um, the photonics, this is the telecom related areas, amplifiers, products for data centers. And then performance products are, again, coming back to the specialized materials for applications. Um, so we're now sh heading to a billion dollar company 10,000 people. Um, so, okay, actually, that's an older slide. So, um, so it is now up, uh, up, uh, up to 10,000 people in 14 countries. So, uh, now, again, I started off by saying vertical integration. And uh, this slide sort of says, so it's going from materials, components, subsystems where we need to, to get the right product to, to what the customers in the market need. Okay, so m moving on to uh, the diamond turning side of things. And uh, this, is a, this slide here, just uh, the development of freeform. So this was a slide that John Schaefer from Raytheon Missile Systems uh, used at the OSA conference last year. And, and what he wanted to show is just how he's seen the pickup in free forms, you know, sort of lagging A spheres by 20 years. But we're, we're, we're into this rise here where we've gone from, you know, into the thousands, 
be people beginning to adopt in free forms. And um, as I actually think about this slide, I actually think this will ramp up faster um, in volume because with the way uh, commercial technologies are using optics now, the timeline for developing things and the quantity of things is, is going up pretty dramatically. Um, we'll show you this video here. Um, so this, this is, see if the sound plays, it doesn't. So, we did, but we'll go without it. So, let's just jump back to the start. So this shows a, a CO2 laser cutting machine. So this is the technology that worked through the 1990s to the 2000s. The laser source that we're showing here is a fast flow laser. And uh, it was the dominant technology for two kilowatts up to about eight kilowatts. And um, we'll take a closer look at this laser cavity later on, but there's a lot of optics in the laser cavity. There's beam delivery optics. You've got beam expander optics here, so these are curved mirrors. You can, there can actually be a deformable mirror in this section of the laser. Then a periscope moving it up, fold mirrors all through. And then the final optic in here is the zinc selenide focusing lens, um, which has very specialized coatings on it, and that becomes a replacement for the customer. So, so uh, we're the world's biggest manufacturer of zinc selenide. We're the world's biggest user of zinc selenide, and most of it is going into consumable products for a CO2 laser, where a customer may be changing that lens out uh, once or twice a week. Um, so these types of machines that we're showing here would be from half a million to a million dollars of investment for the manufacturer. And uh, just uh, there's about 70,000 CO2 lasers installed around the world for cutting out sheet metal. And as I say, now what we see is one micron laser has come in for new lasers. Uh, about 75% of new lasers are one micron. So, so, but the fact that there's still 70,000 installed base, and so as long as people keep their old CO2s and keep using them, so this, the, uh, the CO2 business for 2.6 is doing fine. But, but that's what drove those first 20 years of growth for 2.6, or through the 90s and uh, through to about 2010. That's, that's, that's what was driving the growth of 2.6, was all the optics going into this machine. Um, from... The optics in here, so in the 1990s, uh, you, you have a fold mirror on the back of this laser. You've got fold mirrors to fold the cavity. As people wanted more laser power, they made a longer cavity, they put more fold mirrors in. So these, these mirrors get switched out about once a year in, a, in, in service. So this would be all flat mirrors. So in 1988, 2.6 did its first venture into diamond turning, bought a fly cutter um, just for making copper mirrors. Um, and then, uh, so around the high water mark, so I keep referencing around FY11, which is the high water mark of the CO2, we're producing 110,000 mirrors a year, plano copper mirrors off fly cutters, uh, 2.6. And uh, so using machines like this, so, so the, uh, you know, as, as I say, the laser powers grew, they needed more copper mirrors, we bought more diamond turning machines. Um, so spherical mirrors, um, as they began to understand more about the laser cavity, they realized they wanted to put a little bit of curvature on some of the mirrors in the laser cavity. And this would be a uh, 50 to 100 meter radius of curvature on that mirror. So uh, we, we, we'd already been into 1993, we bought our first two axis machine. That was a million dollar machine from Nank, Rank Numo. That's what diamond turning machines cost at that time. 1995, Prezitech came along with this machine, $200,000. It won't swing as big of a part as a Nanoform 600, but for the copper mirrors that we're putting in into CO2 lasers, this was perfect. We ended up buying about three of these for doing spherical mirrors, producing about 13,000 spherical mirrors. Um, again, going into laser cavities, or going into that beam expander that I showed you in the beam delivery. Um, aspheric optics, the uh, obvious application, um, so for the focusing lenses, if they're long focus lenses, you don't need the A-spheres. But for, for certain applications where the focuses were getting short, now with diamond turning, it becomes very economical to make uh, aspheric 
focusing lenses in zinc selenide. So with, with those machines, we're able to grow our A-sphere business. Uh, there's a big change that happened. It started, uh, probably started about 1995, took about, took Rofin Cena um, through to the late 90s to develop this laser. But this was a change from the fast flow laser. In the fast flow laser, you've got to get air into those beam tubes. You've got to get the air out. You've got to cool it down. You've got to put it back in. And the, the turbo blower technology that does that is, is a big factor. Where you install the laser, you need very high purity gases for the, for the CO2 laser cavity. Um, and as lasers were getting put around all around the world, not every country had good gas supplies. So Rofin developed this diffusion-cooled laser. So it had a parabolic mirror here, parabolic mirror here, full mirror, there's beam shaping mirrors here. So this is the parabolic mirror out of one end. Uh, for a two kilowatt laser, this is an eight inch long slab of copper, integral water cooling in it. Um, has a one fringe figure spec across that eight inches. Um, we had a machine making one of these every 90 minutes, 24 seven um, for 12 years. Um, so we've made a huge amount of these, dialed in the process very, very well. Um, so this is a nice use of two-axis diamond turning. Now, these optics here for the beam shaping um, are all cylinder lenses. So we actually worked with Prezitec to be able to tilt the head on a fly cutter so that you can actually machine a cylinder. Um, so, these so we modified the designs of the fly cut machines. And if you go buy one now, they all have these tilting heads on them. Um, but this, this was set up for 2.6 to supply components into CO2 laser, lasers. Um, this Rofin laser was very, very successful in the marketplace. Trump had to address the, the position that Rofin had set themselves up. So they wanted to come out with a diffusion-cooled laser. Rofin did a great job of tying up all the patents. So they came up with this coaxial design. So they sort of took that cavity, wrapped it around a cylinder, and then uh, this is an axicon, has a, a, actually a toroidal surface at 45 degrees, and this is a helix. So this is, a, so this is the first time you're going into real freeform optics. Um, so the first prototype mirror of this helix was actually made by NC State. So Tom Dow's group at NC State made this. Um, so this is back in 1999. Um, and then uh, once, you know, Trump let us know, yes, that works, they want to go into production, then we actually worked with the Fraunhofer Institute, um, who uh, had fast tool servo, I think it'll be shown on the next page. Um, they licensed the technology to Prezitec, so this was the first adaptation of fast tool servos into diamond turning, was to support this axicon, um, or the helix, in this uh, laser cavity for Trump. So... Um, this was a 35 micron fast tool servo. Fast tool servos have grown in range. You can now get them up to five millimeters stroke length, but this is where it all started. We actually still have this system and we still make mirrors with these helix on them. Um, well, so, so now you can do freeform surfaces. The people making these lasers, they, they were using, uh, they're using uh, spherical optics at 45 degrees. Um, okay, now you actually want a toroidal solution for that, so we can make those toroids. So, so, so the uh, fold optics in these laser cavities became toroids, which we could make again with a fast tool servo here. So, uh, FY, so, we're, um, so we're doing 100 of these a month of toroidal mirrors for, for certain laser companies. Uh, another freeform optic that evolved out of this. And, um, so this is a faceted integrator. Um, so focusing the light with this will create a flat, a flat integrated square focus, can be used in heat treating. Um, so it's kind of a niche, for niche applications, people want this optic. Um, but with the diamond turning, we could make these out of zinc selenide, uh, zinc selenide uh, for 10 micron, and we've done them in zinc sulfide for one micron applications. And, um, I actually remember making these on a fly cutter, tilting each facet in, and spending two days making one of these back in the 1990s. And uh, now you can run this part at 1,000 RPM and cut all these faces in, in about an hour. Um, so
so early 2000s, Slow Tool Servo comes along. So Fast Tool Servo has already been established. Um, fa you know, Fast Tool Servo is about a $100,000 accessory to your diamond turning machine. And then the, the machine vendors worked out, all right, you know, they can create more stroke just moving the Z-axis synchronized to the uh, spindle motion. So, um, so this technology came available, and it was, it was cheap. So for an extra, you know, uh, less than 10% on the price of your machine, you could add this freeform capability that gave you really no limited stroke variation. You just limited on how fast you can spin this while you're accelerating your slides. And it's called slow tool servo because it is slow. Um, it, dri it may drive your cut path to, to be a 10 hour cycle or something. And th then you start having problems with the thermal stability of your lab and your machine in, in the long times that this is gonna run. But uh, um, this is uh, the, how did 2.6, um, you know, we, we very quickly, and every machine we buy has slow tool servo on it, and this illustrates. So in the past, you want a classic off-axis parabola, this would be used to focus a laser beam to the spot here, the customer just wants to specify a working distance. It's not a problem when the customer is specifying 125 millimeters or 250 millimeters as a working distance but we're having people specify 500 millimeters as a working distance. I don't have a machine big enough to swing this on a one, you know, that becomes a one meter machine. Um, so that's the axis of rotation. We're gonna take this part, put it on the spindle axis, cut it with slow tool servo as a free form. You, uh, you eliminate the interrupted cut when it was an off axis part, so you get better surface finish. I don't have to run uh, you know, this shows a setup for the off axis. I, I can cut many parts at a time, but I've got to cut them all, I've got to sell them all. You know, whereas slow tool server, I can make one of these custom to a customer application. It's economic to, in small, small batch quantities. So uh, we, we started making very good use of slow tool servo early on, and uh, I think Greg will talk a bit more about what we've done with slow tool servo. Um, and then when you, you know, so that shows the tooling for slow tool servo. And you can get really fancy and have the fast tool servo running while you're doing slow tool servo and put faceted integrators on an off axis parabola while it's spinning about the center. Um, so this, this becomes very elegant and you can change the uh, facet size and actually add some sphericity into those facets. So it becomes a very versatile and still, still produce surface finishes in the 50 angstrom range with fast tool servo running on slow tool servo. So, um, so that takes me through, through my sections and that's kind of the historical path and you can sort of see how um, it's really our, it's the technology was developing, our customers needs developing, the sophistication of the laser was developing and all that was advancing and making us, you know, make more sophisticated optics. All right, so um, yeah, I guess in, in this section we're going to move on and talk about what the current diamond turning technology is um, for the manufacture of freeform optics. Um, I'll talk about micromilling, vibration assisted machining, and laser assisted machining. Uh, so here's a look at, um, this, this was our first machine that we bought for, specifically for doing micromilling. Uh, and basically, uh, it, it looks just like a regular lathe. I have an x-axis, a z-axis. Here I have a, a c-axis. Uh, and you, you need a, a high um, RPM <coughs> spindle for doing the micromilling to do it efficiently. A um, couple of things to note. Uh, we also have a b-axis on this machine, which we typically don't use during the micromilling process, but you know, we, we use it for other, um, other machining operations if we're doing really steep hemispheres, if, if we need to do some tool normal uh, machining, um, we would use that. But the other thing that's missing is a Y axis. So at the time that we, we bought this machine, we were debating, um, you know, what should we do here? If we get the full five axis machine, um, 
you know, is it going to perform as well as like a standard lathe? You know, can we still achieve the, the surface finishes that we typically get? And at that time, the, the adding an extra axis just sort of added another layer of, uh, of, of roughness. And uh, so, so we just sort of wanted to go away with, do away with it for at that point in time. Uh, and we're still able to do quite a lot of things using X, C, and Z micromilling. Uh, so here, here's an example of a full five-axis machine, and that's what the Y-axis would look like. And it's very similar to the machine that um, that Ron has downstairs in the basement. Um, um, let's see. Oops. So here's an example of uh, a micromilled insert that we've made. So um, this was just a, a sample for us to practice on, uh, but we were able to, uh, with a special diamond cutter, uh, we were able to produce this flat, a uh, little fillet radius at the bottom, a little draft angle here, another radius there, and then we faced off the, the top. The second step was to put these little lenslets, and, and this is the sort of thing that you know, maybe you could make some... Um, uh, you know, optical um, relay, relays, basically, like, you know, to, to connect one fiber to, an, or a, a fiber array to another fiber array is what the idea is of, of this type of optic, or um, mold. Uh, this was made out of aluminum, but typically this would be uh, nickel-plated steel or something like that. Um, so here's an example of how big it is. Um, uh, the spacing we put on this particular optic was uh, 300 microns per uh, lenslet. Um, here's a little video of what XCZ micromilling looks like. So you can see it just sort of oscillates back and forth in X, uh, and then the, the C axis will sort of rotate side to side a little bit. And one thing you'll notice is we always have to, when we do XCZ operations like this for milling, we have to do it off axis. If we do it on axis, you get, um, the, the C axis has to do too large of a move um, and you'll fault your machine. So in hindsight, for micromilling, it's probably a lot easier just to go with an XYZ configuration. But, um, um, it's worked out for us so far on um, on these micromilled inserts. Uh, and then here's just a close-up look at, at the quality that you can get on 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 the edges here. And this is just looking at it with an SEM. Um, uh, and, you know, typical surface roughnesses can be you know, 50 angstroms um, on something like this. Um, so moving beyond micromilling um, to those other applications, the laser assisted and the vibration assisted, it's really about expanding uh, the kind of materials that you can um, diamond turn. So um, this is just a, a list of some um, elements. Um, and the ones that are highlighted in green here are diamond turnable. And it has to do with the, the chemistry Really, it's the, the number of unpaired D-shell electrons tends to be the uh, determining factor in terms of whether or not a, a diamond tool can, can cut these materials. But uh, you know, the common ones for us would be copper uh, and aluminum. We also do germanium and silicon. Um, uh, uh, and all of these ones highlighted in red, not diamond turnable. Uh, they all have these unpaired D shell electrons. Um, so uh, one of these in particular, uh, nickel, you can play some tricks with nickel and if you add some phosphorus to it, um, it, uh, it somehow becomes diamond turnable. And, and I don't really understand all the chemistry behind it, but that's just, uh, so, so whenever we actually get a nickel plating, it's really a, a nickel with 10 to 12% phosphorus in it. Um, uh, but you can't really do that with, with all these other materials. So, so laser-assisted machining, um, uh, I have silicon here highlighted um, along with tungsten. 
with silicon, you can already diamond turn silicon, but the problem is it's really rough on diamond tools. Um, um, you, you may get a few passes on a, on a large optic before your tool degrades and you can't really do any more cutting. Uh, with the laser assisted, it really helps the tool life. Um, uh, and so, so there's some value with that. I think, I think most of the customers purchasing uh, that microlam system uh, do it for silicon. Uh, but there are other uh, applications for it too. Uh, there, with with uh, involving tungsten that I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and then also with vibration assisted. Um, so, so vibration assisted, here's iron that I have highlighted. Um, you can't diamond turn steel, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a big issue. Uh, but with vibration assisted machining, it, uh, it allows that to be diamond turned. Uh, so, so I'm going to start here with the vibration-assisted machining, and here's just one example of a commercial, commercially available system from Sonex. Um, so basically, there's a, um, a sonotrode that's shaking a, uh, a, a tool, a, a, like a, a diamond tool shank, and it's setting up a vibration right at the tip, and it's a, a very special design. Um, they're very particular about the modeling of that to, to get that to vibrate just right. Um, but, the, you know, they're operating around 100 kilohertz. Or, um, so the, the, the main idea behind vibration-assisted machining is um, the material is flowing down towards your tool, and your tool is shaking upwards towards it. It then starts to back off faster than the flow of the material uh, as it's flowing towards the tool. So it, it breaks contact, has a chance to uh, cool down, and, 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 and it's not entirely clear what the, the mechanism for why it works, but, but that's what's happening. And then, then, it, then it goes back into contact and, and takes, takes another uh, shot at the chip. So with vibration-assisted machining here, there, this is an example from uh, Durham Precision Optics. Uh, where they cut a free-form stainless steel part. Um, and you can see this looks gorgeous. Uh, you, you just couldn't do this with a standard diamond tool. Uh, here they're looking at 65 angstroms RMS on the roughness. Um, the downside to this is you, you just can't go faster than the, the feed of the material as it's flowing underneath the tool. So. Uh, you're really limited in how, how fast you can turn the optic. So th there, there is a, a time penalty uh, associated with machining steel with vibration-assisted machining. Um, so here's a look at what laser-assisted machining looks like. Um, uh, so this is the microlam system. Uh, they have, a, I believe it's a 200-watt uh, IPG fiber laser that they, they bring to a focus uh, inside, or basically right at the tip of the diamond. So they, they have to have really design this tool uh, very carefully so that the, the laser light can get in. Uh, you know, they don't do anything special with the, uh, the back surface of this diamond, so, so some of the light actually gets reflected back and gets absorbed into the tool post. But a lot of the light still makes it through to the tip. Um, uh, and that light is heating up the material as it's approaching the diamond tool. Uh, and it softens it up and makes it easier to cut. Um, so their, their prime example that they like to sell their equipment for is, um, is on silicon. Uh, they're able to machine it two to five times faster and get better surface finish. Um, you know, with single crystal silicon, you often see the, the, the three-spoke pattern, uh, so that really reduces that, um, and the tool life is considerably better. Um, but uh, one of the more interesting ones um, uh, for you guys, now that you have the, um, the, the glass molding machine downstairs, um, is this tungsten carbide mold insert. 
So conventionally with this laser assisted machining, or without laser assisted machining, the, the diamond just wears you know, pretty much instantly. And this is just isn't going to work for an optic. Um, uh, this is what the diamond looks like. This is the top rake of the diamond. This is the front clearance. And you see all this damage just coming off that front edge down the front clearance. With the microlam, um, it looks much better. Very little damage here on the diamond. And that's after five passes. Um, so at, at 2.6, we have um, this microlam system. Um, we're, we're trying to use it for other materials than this, and um, uh, particularly on crystalline materials like uh, zinc selenide, zinc sulfide. And we're just trying to tune in the parameters to help reduce the amount of haze that shows up on, on those materials. That can, that's, that's often a problem when, when diamond turning uh, zinc sulfide and zinc selenide. So, um, uh, but uh, you know, silicon would also be another uh, option for us for, for the optics that we do. Um, all right, um, so just for moving on to the final section, I want to talk about diamond turning applications at shorter wavelengths. Um, so near IR, visible, and UV. So I um, just want to show you something that you guys may have seen in the past. There's an appetizing phase plate that we we did for um, Matthew Kenworthy at the Stewart Observatory a number of years ago. Um, talk about some one micron high power applications and then uh, post polishing uh, as well. Um, okay, so th this is a zinc selenide appetizing phase plate. Um, I'm not going to I, I have no idea how you guys design this sort of thing. That, that's, your, that's your job. Uh, I just have to figure out how to make it. Um, so I was given a, uh, basically a map of what this surface looks like. Um, and really, to, 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 to produce this whole optic, what we had to do was basically make a, a donut-shaped pedestal in zinc selenide then coat it with gold just because they wanted a, an aperture stop. Uh, like, you know, just to close everything off there. And, um, and then we would diamond turn off the gold and then coat it with um, whatever coating uh, they wanted for the uh, transmission. Um, so with this, I had a, 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 a just a map of the surface, and I was able to feed that into the fast tool servo. Um, and basically, the fast tool servo was able to to follow these contours, which were on the order of a maybe a micron, or uh, maybe a few microns, I think. Um, uh, and, and this was designed to work in the L band, so I think that's three and a half microns. Um, so, so th it was it was out of our 10.6 micron niche, and it was just you know, one little dive into uh, shorter wavelengths for us. Uh, now, diamond turning is good enough as is to just get you the surface finish that you need at, at that wavelength. But as you get closer to one micron and into the visible, uh, that changes. Uh, one other thing to note, we, we needed to have this at a, uh, with a one degree wedge. So we actually used the slow tool servo at the same time. We just did a once per ev sine wave um, with the slow tool servo to produce that uh, um, one degree wedge while the fast tool servo was producing this surface. And, um, and this is just an example of this in use, and they were able to find uh, exoplanet beta pictoris b. So, uh, okay, moving on to high power applications. This is. Um, uh, multispectral zinc sulfide. Um, this is a material that we grow. Uh, what we like about it is it has really good transmission at one micron. Uh, it's really good thermal conductivity. It's diamond turnable. Um, one downside is, it, is that it's polycrystalline and it tends to cause scatter. So the vast majority of um, you know, optics for fiber lasers are typically fused silica because there's very little uh, scatter. But 
there is uh, some room for for zinc sulfide in some applications. Um, so, so here's an example of um, uh, a zinc sulfide beam shaping optic. Um, so this optic has a number of hexagons. It's a, it's a hexagonal faceted array. Um, and what we tried to do is get it to produce a, uh, a ring. And it's actually, you can sort of see the six lobes on this ring. Um, uh, one of the problems with, uh, with cutting with fiber lasers is that you know, if, you, if you just have a, a standard optic, it has too nice of a focus. Uh, in the, the, it's, the depth of focus isn't good enough for cutting thick material. So if we spoil the focus in just the right way, it tends to um, uh, lengthen the depth at which you can get good cutting parameters. So we basically program cones on each one of these little facets, and it, it all superimposes and, um, at the focus, and you get a nice ring. Um, so, uh, yeah, so diamond turning is a, a great application for, for doing a, a, a beam shaping optic like this. Um, so here's a, a, another example. This is a, a variable Axicon lens. This is a design from um, 2.6's Hayeg group. They're based in Germany. Um, so uh, what they did was um, they made an, it, it's something of an Alvarez um, type setup, but what it does is creates a variable cone instead of variable power. Um, and my job was to basically produce this surface. Um, and uh, so we did that using slow tool servo. Um, so one one thing I want you to look at is this. Uh, this is a radial slice of of this image up here. And as I I, I set up these two optics together that, um, and just wanted to measure what the wavefront looked like in a Heaney interferometer. And as I move, you can see how that that cone goes from convex to concave just by shifting these two optics side to side. So um, one thing I'm not real proud of is there's a little hitch in the fringes here, and I'm not sure what caused that. But um, I think it worked well enough for their application. Um, so uh, all right. Um, and finally, uh, post polishing for near IR visible and UV applications. So this, if you're not used to seeing diamond turned optics, this is a, this is a piece of silicon. That's just what it looks like, particularly after after the tool's been used a couple of times um, or made a couple of passes across this part. You get uh, diffraction, just like you'd see on a CD or a DVD. Um, this is a, a nickel-plated aluminum piece, and you see all the, this, you know, rainbow diffraction coming off the part. This is really bad, obviously, in the in the visible applications uh, in and UV, where people care about stray light and things like that. Um, so, if we ever want to extend the usefulness of diamond turning, you know, you know, it gets you really close to the final shape and the final finish. We just need to get rid of those tool lines and, and maybe clean up the, the figure a little bit. Um, so this was something we started uh, playing with a little bit um, over the last year. And we're, we're not uh, professionals uh, you know, like you guys at, at, at doing you know, uh, really complex polishing raster schemes. But we gave it a shot on one of our diamond turning machines. So this is where. If you go back to that um, image of the diamond turning machine that I had before, we had a B axis on it. You can actually put a, a polishing bonnet on that B axis and do some tool normal polishing, which is what we did on this optic. So this is just a, a parabola with a, a hole in it. It's about six inches in diameter. You can see the little rainbow pattern here. Um, uh, and this is what it looks like after we CNC polished it, and it it gets rid of all that that rainbow 
And it's hard to see maybe in this image, but the, there are some diamond turning lines that you can see here that are, are, are gone up here. Um, this is what the, the fringe pattern looked like of that optic. Um, and w with some, a, a rudimentary feedback scheme, uh, we were able to, to reduce the figure a bit. Um, uh, and, and this was something that we just wanted to explore and see what we could do. Um, and we're thinking of, you know, a diamond turning machine isn't necessarily the, that's not the, the machine you'd want to use for this. Uh, you don't want to use an air bearing spindle to hold your part. It's not, uh, it's not ideal. But um, we've got some ideas for what we want to do in the future. Um, uh, this was just a, a look at what the finish was. So here we were about 3 nanometers RMS roughness. Uh, on the diamond turned part, um, after we did the 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 polishing, we got it down to uh, 0.8 nanometers. And you can just see the difference in the the tool lines and and where it went to. So uh, that's uh, that's definitely something we want to get into in the future. And um, and so we're always looking to. to to work with you guys and, and learn what we can from, from you on that. Um, and uh, I think that concludes our talk. So, so thanks for your attention. We've got uh, time for some questions.